Hi, everybody, and welcome back for another chapter of Sri Nisargadatta Maharaja's I Am That. Only about 10 chapters left here from this great and wonderful book. Chapter 91 today, Pleasure and Happiness. Pleasure and Happiness. Everybody loves pleasure. Everybody loves happiness, yes? <laughs> Let's see what Nisargadatta Maharaj has to say about it. So the person starts asking or saying, there is a yogi living not far from Bombay who possesses some miraculous powers. He has specialized in the control of the vital forces governing the body. I met some of his disciples and sent through to the yogi my friend's letter and photo. Let us see what happens. Yes. Miracles often take place. Miracles do happen, they do exist, they do take place, but there must also be the will to live. Without the will to live, the miracles will not happen. So if you want to live, the miracles will happen. But if you don't want to live, then no matter what medicine you take or whatever you do, it won't work. Can such a desire be instilled? Superficial desire, yes, but it will wear out. Fundamentally, nobody can compel another to live. I think there are a few people that need to hear this, <laughs> maybe in the healthcare profession. Nobody can compel another to live. If somebody wants to die, I know it sounds like a big deal, and it is, but it's their right to choose. They are free to choose. They're not the body anyways. So if the body wants to go and they want to discard the garment called the body, we have to give people the freedom to make their own decisions. We don't want to force anything on anybody. This is not about forcing people, controlling people, manipulating people. This is about loving people, loving people, supporting people, being compassionate, helping people to discover their own truth. Not to force our truth down somebody's throat. So, simple question you can ask anybody, what do you want? What do you want? And those wants, of course, as we know, may or may not change from moment to moment. Maybe one day, yes, I want to live. The next day, no thank you, <laughs> check please. <laughs> Maybe they're ready to leave. But we must ask them, their heart knows. You could say their soul knows. Everybody knows when it's their time to leave the body. So fundamentally, nobody can compel another to live. Besides, there were cultures in which suicide had its acknowledged and respected place. Mostly in the Western culture, in the Catholic culture, um, they look down upon suicide and they say you'll even go to hell or something like that if you commit suicide. But in some societies, it's accepted. If somebody has a terminal disease or if there's great suffering, sometimes that is perhaps, perhaps, the best and wisest solution is to end the life of the body. Remember, you are not the body. Now, I don't say any of this lightly. I don't really care what you do. <laughs> I'm merely uh, reading Nisargadatta's words and just speaking whatever comes to my mind, actually. Is it not obligatory to live out one's natural span of life? Natural, spontaneously, Easy? Yes. But <laughs> disease and suffering are not natural. Disease and suffering are not natural. There is noble virtue in unshakable endurance of whatever comes. But there is also dignity in the refusal of meaningless torture and humiliation. There is also dignity in the refusal 
of meaningless torture and humiliation. Every teacher teaches according to his own experience, of course. Experience is shaped by belief, and belief is shaped by experience. Even the guru is shaped by the disciple to his own image. It is the disciple that makes the guru great. Once the guru is seen to be the agent of a liberating power, which works both from within and without, wholehearted surrender becomes natural and easy. Just as a man gripped by pain puts himself completely in the hands of a surgeon, so does the disciple entrust himself without reservation to his guru. It is quite natural to seek help when its need is felt acutely. But, however powerful the guru may be, he should not impose his will on the disciple. On the other hand, a disciple that distrusts and hesitates is bound to remain unfulfilled for no fault of his guru. So, maybe that's confusing, but that's how it is. A guru should not impose his will on the disciple, and yet a disciple who has truly surrendered to the guru must trust that guru and shouldn't hesitate. Otherwise, he's bound to remain unfulfilled. What happens then? Well, life is the guru. Life is always teaching us if we are paying attention. Every day we have the potential of learning something of becoming wiser and more intelligent about living as a human being, living as pure consciousness on this planet. But the lessons of life take a long time to come. Much delay and trouble is saved by trusting and obeying the Guru. But such trust comes only when indifference and restlessness give place to clarity and peace. A man who keeps himself in low esteem will not be able to trust himself, nor anybody else. Therefore, in the beginning, the teacher tries his best to reassure the disciple as to his high origin, noble nature, and glorious destiny. He relates to him the experiences of some saints as well as his own, instilling confidence in himself and in his infinite possibilities. When self-confidence and trust in the teacher come together, rapid and far-going changes in the disciple's character and life can take place. I may not want to change. My life is good enough as it is. You say so because you have not seen how painful is the life you live. You are like a child sleeping with a lollipop in its mouth. You may feel happy for a moment by being totally self-centered, but it is enough to have a good look at human faces to perceive the universality of suffering. Simply look around, you will see human beings who are suffering. Not everybody is in bliss. Not everybody is happy. Many people are suffering for whatever reason. Even your own happiness is so vulnerable and short-lived at the mercy of a bank crash or a stomach ulcer. It is just a moment of respite, a mere gap between two sorrows. Real happiness is not vulnerable because it does not depend on circumstances. The real happiness, which is a result of self-realization, self-liberation, knowing your true nature, the death of the ego, it is not vulnerable. It doesn't come and go, and it doesn't depend on circumstances, inner or outer. Are you talking from your own experience? Are you too unhappy? 
I have no personal problems, but the world is full of living beings whose lives are squeezed between fear and craving, desire and fear. They are like cattle driven to the slaughterhouse, jumping and frisking, carefree and happy, yet dead and skinned within an hour. You say you are happy. Are you really happy? Or are you merely trying to convince yourself? Look at yourself fearlessly, and you will at once realize that your happiness depends on conditions and circumstances. Hence, it is momentary, not real. Real happiness flows from within. Real happiness flows from within. Real happiness is not dependent on circumstances or conditions. Shanti, 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 Om, peace, peace, peace. Thank you, Nisgadatta Maharaj, and thank you, everybody. See you again for another chapter of I Am That. <laughs>